Good morning and happy Easter 2023. Um, we'll be reading a, a number of Easter uh, texts and singing a lot of Easter hymns in our sanctuary this morning. I'm going to read one from the tomb for you now, Luke 24, 1 through 12. On the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to Jesus' tomb taking the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told this to all the eleven and all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles that these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping, and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. May it be so in all of us, my friends. Now, our sermon this morning is going to focus a little bit more on the meaning of this, and use a text from 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, here we go. You know, there was a, some years ago, a television preacher was being interviewed. And finally, at the last, the interviewer asked a critical question. What do you think about Jesus? The teacher replied, Jesus was the most successful religious figure of all time. Just consider it. He began in obscure surroundings amid poverty and despair. And today his followers outnumber those of any of the other of the world's religions. That's astounding. But I thought he ended up on a cross, said the interviewer. Take a moment, let that sink in. Most successful religious figure of all time ended up on a cross. The Apostles' Creed lines them all up. Number one, born of the Virgin Mary. Number two, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Number three, was crucified, dead, and buried. Number four, he descended into hell. Number five, the third day he rose again from the dead. Number six, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And seven, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Are any of those more important than the others? Well, maybe you're sort of a Christmas kind of person who thinks that Jesus' birth was the most important. Every, after all, everything else flowed from that. Or maybe you're a Good Friday kind of person. You love the old rugged cross and think that the crucifixion was the most important part. Jesus took the penalty for our sins. Or perhaps you're a future-oriented Christian who so looks forward to the second coming of Christ. That will be the end of the age after all, the completion of all things, the resurrection of the dead, and the start of life everlasting. Or maybe you are just ready to stop today on Easter. Jesus was raised and that's good enough for you. I have faith in Jesus and feel I've been raised to new life with him, you exclaim. You know, I guarantee you that there are sermons being preached this morning that overemphasize one of these or even deny some of them. Some preacher somewhere is emphasizing God's love, but denying God's power, implying that the empty tomb was a fiction. Such skepticism today often comes from misplaced notions of scientific doubt, as if the resurrection of Jesus was a reproducible experiment rather than a one-time historical event. This is a completely wrong-headed view, of course. The resurrection happened once, and it won't happen again until it happens for all of us at the end of the age, the second coming of Christ. 
But denial of the resurrection is nothing new. We know from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians that some people in the church of Corinth in the first century denied the resurrection too. And that was a paltry 30 years after Jesus' death. This church apparently denied that Jesus was raised from the dead and didn't think that anyone else would be either. We aren't completely sure why they thought that. We have Paul's arguments against them, but we don't really know what they wrote. Uh, many scholars argue that somehow they assumed we were already fully redeemed and there was nothing left for God to do in us. In essence, we had no further need for God. Another angle may have had to do with their cultural understanding that physical bodies were an impediment to spiritual growth. Some Greeks had, in those days had a, time, a saying that went something like this, I am a poor soul shackled to a corpse. Ugh, what a horrible way to think about your body. But such beliefs were a thing in those days, so the idea of bodily resurrection may have just sounded distasteful to them. Or perhaps they believed in some kind of spiritual resurrection, like Jesus' soul went directly to heaven. That opens up all kinds of inconsistencies if you take the gospel accounts seriously. And certainly, Paul will have none of it. His forceful and extensive response is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm going to read and comment on that text this morning. Let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. Right? This is something you heard and believed at some point. Stick with it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. But I passed on to you what was most important and what had been passed on to me. Paul didn't make this up. It's been a message of the church that's been passed down from generation to generation. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures, by which Paul means the Old Testament, um, said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter, by the 12 apostles. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. And last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am the least of all apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. Paul's a real conversion story, you know, went from a persecutor to a preacher. But whatever I am now, verse 10, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but God who has been working through me by his grace. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach, for we all preach the same message that you have already believed. My summary of this, Mike, is that the good news of the resurrection was something which the Corinthians have received. No one ever invented the gospel for themselves. It is something we receive. And that's the very function of the church. The church is a repository and a transmitter of the good news. That's one of the church fathers had it. No one can have God for his father unless he has the church for his mother. Now, uh, listen to the importance Paul puts on this next section. I'm going to start at verse 12. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there is no resurrection from the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless, and we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from a grave. 
But that can't be true if there's no resurrection from the dead. And if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, well, then we're more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. So you see, just as Christ came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Jesus was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Verse 24. After that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For the scriptures say, God has put all things under his authority. Of course, when it says all things are under his authority, that does not include God himself who gave Christ his authority. Anyway, verse 28, then when all things are under his authority, the son will put himself under God's authority. So the God who gave his son authority over all things will be utterly supreme over everything, everywhere. If the dead will not be raised, verse 29, what point is there in people being baptized for those who are dead? Why do it unless the dead will someday rise? This is a little bit of a confusing verse. I take it to mean, if the dead will not be raised, why should anyone get baptized? But verse 30. And why should we risk ourselves hour by hour? For I swear, dear brothers and sisters, that I face death daily. This is as certain as my pride in what Christ Jesus, our Lord, has done in you. And what value is there in fighting wild beasts, those people of Ephesus, if there is no resurrection from the dead? And if there is no resurrection, well then, uh, let's feast and drink, for tomorrow we die. Don't be fooled by people who say such things for bad company corrupts good character. Think carefully about what is right and stop sinning. For to your shame, I say that some of you don't know God at all. I'm going to pause for a minute in my long quotation of Paul and uh, speak a little bit about pagan religion and its views of death. I'm going to give an eerie passage from Homer's Odyssey. It's a famous Greek tale where the protagonist Odysseus sacrifices some animals at the gates of Hades and the shades of the dead, their ghosts, their phantoms come, come to drink the blood. Um, there is one of his own sailors that was killed who charges Odysseus to go back and bury his body. And there is Odysseus's mother that he tries to embrace. Quote, thrice through my arm she slipped like empty wind, or dreams, the vain illusions of the mind. These were dead who were burdened with cares, joyless dead who felt no pleasure. There was nothing peaceful about these dead, nothing enlightened. That is, that is not what we have to look forward to. Indeed, it's quite the opposite. The risen Christ and the angelic messengers the women encounter near the empty tomb are joyful, even playful. The risen Christ who appears to his disciples brings them peace and blesses them. He proves he is not a ghost or shade, 
Jesus proves this, he's not a ghost or a shade by eating in their presence, because everyone knew the ghost didn't eat. I'm going to continue quoting Paul in verse 35. But someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question, verse 36. And now Paul's going to go on to use uh, the metaphor of a seed and a plant to talk about this. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first, like the seed germinates, right? And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of whatever you are planting. Then God gives it the new body he wants it to have. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. Similarly, there are different kinds of flesh. One kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are also bodies in the heavens and bodies on earth. The glory of the heavenly bodies is different from the glory of earthly bodies. The sun has one kind of glory, while the moon and the stars have another kind. And even the stars differ from each other in their glory. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are spiritual bodies. That was verse 44. The scriptures tell us that the first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, and then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth. Well, Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. Verse 50. What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me tell you a wonderful secret. We will not all die. We will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to life forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where? Where is your victory? Nowhere. Oh, death, where is your sting? I don't feel a thing. For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us the victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. That's it. May God bless you all today and always. And if anybody wants to talk about these matters, private message me. Give me a call. Happy to do it. Bye now.